Developing right now on Morning News Now, retaliation fueling fears of escalation. Israel now assessing the damage from its promised counterstrike in Iran just days after Iran's first ever direct assault on Israel. We have team coverage. Also this morning, a milestone moment in Donald Trump's historic New York hush money trial. Twelve jurors and an alternate now sworn in as the former president lashes out about the case. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. What we know about who's in the jury box, including why two previously picked jurors were dismissed. Plus, something to sneeze at this spring, shaping up to be a tough one for allergy sufferers. We'll get to the root of it. And surprise, Swifties, I hope you're ready for it, because Taylor Swift is back with not just one, but two new albums. We're going to tell you about the highly anticipated midnight release of the Tortured Poets Department and a surprise second drop just hours later. Perhaps you haven't even slept. You've just been listening all morning long to all that new music. Good to have you with us on this Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off this morning. We begin this morning with that Israeli attack on Iran, a move that is threatening to further escalate tensions between the regional foes. A source has told NBC News that Israel carried out a limited strike inside Iran. Explosions were reported in the skies of two Iranian cities, including Isfahan, which is home to a nuclear facility. Now, this video verified by NBC News appears to show a strike over that city. But this morning, Iran is downplaying the incident, saying that its air defenses shot down three drones and that the area was safe. The Israeli attack comes almost a week after Iran launched a barrage of missiles and drones toward Israel, which were mostly intercepted. That attack was in retaliation to an Israeli strike on Iran's consulate in Syria earlier this month, which killed top Iranian military commanders. We've got a team standing by to talk more about this and what it means for the broader region. We're going to start things off with NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez, who's in Tel Aviv. So, Raf, walk us through what we know about this Israeli attack. Attack, and do we know what it was targeting inside Iran? Are the Israelis saying anything about it? Joe, the Israelis are saying nothing on the record. They are neither confirming nor denying that they were responsible for this attack inside Iran. And that seems to be very much by design. They're not crowing. They're not gloating. They're not rubbing the Iranians' faces in this. And the hope seems to be that if they don't escalate from a war of words perspective, the Iranians may feel that they are not under pressure to retaliate militarily. Now, here's what we do know. A source familiar with the situation says Israel carried out a limited strike inside of Iran. They've spent the last couple of hours assessing the damage, the effectiveness of it. We don't know at this point whether the strike was carried out by aircraft, missiles, drones. We do know that the U.S. received at least some heads up that American forces had time to get their own air defenses on high alert in the event that Iranian troops targeted U.S. forces across the region. There's no indication at this point. The U.S. also did not take part in the strike. That's according to U.S. officials. They are eager to stress that at this point. Here inside of Israel, there has been no new restrictions for the Israeli civilian population. And, Joe, that appears to be an indication that at least right now, the Israelis are not bracing for major Iranian retaliation. And Ar Iran appears to be downplaying this attack. What are we hearing from Iran and from its state media? Any signs Iran could retaliate? It's really striking, Joe. They are really downplaying what happened in the early hours this morning. The Iranian president spoke a little while earlier, and he made no mention of this attack whatsoever. Now, as far as we can tell, the main target appears to have been a military base near the city of Isfahan. That's a couple of hours south of Tehran. People there woken up around 4 in the morning by explosions in the sky above. But Iranian state television has been stressing all morning that the explosions were caused by 
uh, Iranian air defenses going off. They are stressing <clears throat> that life inside of Isfahan is normal. We have actually been seeing, in some cases, Iranian state media almost making fun of what happens, uh, releasing memes showing a kind of almost laughably small hole in the dirt saying this was the attack. But crucially, Joe, at this point, Iran is not vowing retaliation, and they do not officially, at least, appear to be even pointing the finger of blame at Israel. Joe. All right. Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv. Raf, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, good morning. So a source tells NBC News Israeli officials in Inform the U.S. of its intention to carry out a response to last weekend's attack on Israel. Any response from the White House reacting to these new developments? Yeah, Joe, good morning. Well, we're still awaiting official White House reaction. It seems like the first reaction we're going to get from the Biden administration could come from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who is in Italy right now, actually, for the last few days, meeting with G7 leaders to, among other things, contain the fallout from the Israel-Hamas war and especially the developments over the last week. And as we wait for that uh, reaction, we do know, as you heard uh, Roth mention, that the U.S. was notified beforehand of this attack uh, by Israel that the U.S. did not take part in. We know that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin shared a phone call with his Israeli counterpart yesterday, and U.S. officials also met with Israeli officials virtually to talk about the situation in Rafah. It's not clear uh, whether this was discussed on either or both of those calls, potentially neither of them, but we do know uh, that the U.S. was informed beforehand. And if you remember the backdrop uh, of this uh, this action by Israel, the backdrop that this comes against with the president telling Prime Minister Netanyahu on a call last weekend uh, essentially to take the win when those uh, missiles that were launched by Iran were intercepted coming into Israel, saying that that demonstrated Israel's ability to uh, defend itself. The president on that call urging Netanyahu not to take any retaliatory steps towards Iran and clearly saying to Netanyahu that if he did, that the U.S. would not be involved in any of those offensive uh, measures. The president consistently trying to use diplomacy to de-escalate uh, and urge restraint to uh, the Israelis really over the last uh, six months now since the Israel-Hamas war began, but especially over the last few days. And ever since then, we have seen U.S. officials repeatedly come out and stress that they are not seeking a wider war. They are not seeking a direct war with Iran. So the president, U.S. officials certainly uh, knew this was a real possibility this would happen, but still uh, still stressing uh, the need to issue restraint and, and practice that by the Israelis, Joe. So, Ali, the U.S., of course, not involved in this strike, but just hours earlier, the Biden administration did impose new sanctions that targeted Iran's missile and drone program. What should we know about that? Yeah, this was an action taken not just by the U.S., but also the U.K. and E.U., and it came after coordination between the U.S. and G7 allies in the aftermath of those uh, strikes by Iran last weekend. These are aimed specifically at Iran's missile and drone program. They came in response to those strikes, uh, and it is used, it is going to be used to essentially wean off Iran's ability to supply its weapons program, not just for Iran, but also its proxy groups like Hezbollah which helped Iran uh, uh, start those uh, missile attacks last weekend. And we saw in a statement by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, she said in part, quote, we will continue to deploy our sanctions authority to counter Iran with further actions in the days and weeks ahead. Of course, all of this following, following into that approach I mentioned by President Biden to use diplomacy instead of military action uh, to squeeze Tehran of these resources, Joe. All right, Ali Rafa at the White House. Ali, thank you so much. Let's get more reaction now from Hagar Shamali. She is the host of Oh My World on YouTube and a former NSC director for Syria and Lebanon. Hagar, good to have you with us. What do you make of this attack by Israel? I mean, early signs suggest it was limited. So what kind of message is the Israelis attempting to send here? 
That's right. It was it was relatively restrained. And and honestly, I expected Israel to respond. I expected the response to be restrained. And this was, as far as we know, uh, the Iranian response is what I find the most fascinating. And Raf really hit on this as the fact that usually, by the way, when the Iranian regime is struck or when there is something like this, they speak publicly with a lot of drama, with a lot of bombastic remarks. And and keep in mind that the, it is not 7 a.m. their time. It's already well into the afternoon, they've had time to respond, and they are trying to downplay this. And I think that's because they're trying to give themselves wiggle room to mosey on out. Now, that said, that doesn't mean that the cycle of the general broader war between Israel and Iran, between Israel and Iran's proxies, doesn't continue. It will continue. But that means that I don't expect what happened last night to turn into something, uh, to a wide-scale, full regional war. The thing that I would try to remember is that Israel is trying to send a message of deterrence without escalating further, and Iran is trying to test red lines. Yeah, let's talk more about that. An Iranian official was quoted as saying there were no plans for an immediate retaliation. How are you interpreting Iran's response? Could this potentially be the off-ramp both sides might have been looking for? An off-ramp is a good way to look at it, uh, because Iran, if you remember, after Israel, after the Iranian assault on Israel and Israel's vow to respond, Iran said that they would have their hands on the trigger and that, quote, they would respond within seconds. Well, it's been hours, so I'm not sure if that's necessarily true. And I, again, I think what you see them saying to the public is that they've intercepted everything in the sky, that, that there was this attempt and that it failed, and, and there you go. And so I think they are trying to build themselves this off-ramp if needed, because because they are aware that while they are testing red lines, they don't want to go to the United States specifically into a war. And the U.S. is also communicating the same thing. Yeah, I mean, let's talk more about the U.S. Before this happened, the U.S. and others made it clear they didn't want Israel to attack Iran and risk escalating the situation further. I mean, so with what we're seeing this morning, do you think the Biden administration will be angry or annoyed with how this went down or maybe even a little bit relieved? Yeah, I don't think they'll be angry or annoyed because I think that having worked with the Israeli government very closely when I was at the White House, they are used to the Israeli government at the end of the day making decisions on its own, even if it is influenced. And they are influenced by the U.S. perspective. They do care about it. But the, but the White House is going to expect Israel to do its own thing. And to be honest with you, there was an argument for both sides. The U.S. is trying to say, let take, take the win and don't escalate this further. And Israel is trying to say, Iran pursued this unprecedented attack and we have to send a message of deterrence, but we will do it so that it doesn't escalate things too much. So there was an argument both ways, and I think the White House is going to say, all right, now let's try and calm things down, and they'll try and send messages to Iran indirectly through other partners. All right, Hagar Shamali, we always appreciate your expertise on a busy morning like this. Thank you so much. This morning marks a moment in American history. A jury has now been sworn in for the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Twelve jurors have now been selected to hear the Trump hush money case, but not before the process appeared to suffer a setback. That's because two previously selected jurors were dismissed from the case. One juror had second thoughts about her ability to remain impartial in the case. The other was dismissed over an apparent failure to disclose previous interactions with law enforcement. This Manhattan jury will now decide whether the former president illegally falsified business records as part of a scheme to conceal alleged hush money payments to an adult film star. Trump is alleged to have had an affair with her. Trump denies those allegations. For more, we're joined on set by NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns and NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sanadella. Good to have you both with us. So we have this jury now, yeah. 12 jurors. It's a milestone in the case. It only took three days. We thought it could take up to 12 weeks. What should we know here? Yeah, we were expecting one to two weeks. We're on the shorter end of that timeline. And this is in part because the judge did really want to move things along. Earlier in the week, there were uh, some frustrations from Judge Marshawn on too much minutia, too many motions that were, the lawyers were trying to discuss. He said, look, let's get this jury process finished up. He moved uh, the gag order hearing that uh, the prosecutors were asking for. He set that for next Tuesday. 
so that he could get through this jury selection process. What we have so far, seven men and five women will be on this jury. We've got a couple of attorneys, a salesman, a teacher, a software engineer, speech therapist, physical therapist, a retired wealth manager, a range of ages, Joe, and one of the alternates has been selected. And there'll be more alternates selected. There will be more correct? alternates selected today. That's slated for All later right. today. So, so we have this situation, Angela, where two jurors who had been picked had been dismissed. How unusual was that? What should we know about that? So it's not unusual generally for jurors to be dismissed. They're like you, me, they're busy, they have lives, they're real people, commitments. But it is unusual. It happened so fast, even before the trial is starting. But given that one of them went to the judge and said she had questions about her own impartiality, it's somewhat honorable that it's happening so early. You prefer it to happen earlier rather than later so that you don't get down to your last alternate and wonder if the, the whole trial has to start again. So let's talk about what we think is going to happen today, which is the judge is going to decide how much of Trump's past can be a part of this trial. How does the judge go about making that decision? How important is it in the scope of everything the jury has to consider? So it's extremely important, given that the questions here surround whether or not Trump will take the stand, and if he does, what sorts of questions can be asked on cross-examination. So Trump is unusual in that he has this legal record of lying. Most of us don't have that. But given the E. Jean Carroll, where this definition verdict was turned against him, it's shown he was lying there. Similarly, in the other case with the civil fraud, he went on the stand and the judge said, you are lying. So being uncredible is what the prosecution wants to bring in in cross-examination to really break down his credibility. And so can that be introduced? That's a question the judge will have to decide. And it is an art. It's it's not a science there. It's the probative value versus the prejudicial value. So we'll see what he decides. And then from there, what's the timeline? What are we looking at as far as it's moving along at a good pace so far, but this is just the first few days. Moving along at a good pace. So Judge Rashawn has called 96 additional potential alternate jurors today. So we need 12 jurors, six alternates. So that means we need five more alternates selected today. He expects that that will happen, which means, Joe, that the first opening statements in a criminal trial against a former president could begin as soon as Monday. Which is just surprising that we're moving at this rate right That's now. Right. And then this is a trial that we still think is expected to last about six weeks once it gets going, or could it even be faster than that? About six weeks is what we're expecting, but as we've already seen, things can take some steps back and some quick steps forward, so we'll have to see how it goes. Angela, what will you be watching out for when we get into these opening and closing statements? So I will be really looking for this question of intent. I think that's really the hardest thing the prosecutors have to prove here. So we know there are documents. We know there are physical records that prove that he likely did falsify the business records. But in order for it to be a felony, they also have to prove it was intended to conceal another crime. And that here is interfering in the election. So that is what the prosecution's going to have to prove. And that's what the defense is going to say. No, we were just looking to protect him from Melania or protect Melania or their children. So there is a lot to be argued here about intent. All right. We'll see what happens. Dasha Burns, Angela Senadella, appreciate you both. Thank you so much. Now to Capitol Hill, where the House of Representatives is nearing a possible vote this weekend on foreign aid packages to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. This comes as embattled House Speaker Mike Johnson continues to face criticism from fellow House Republicans who are opposed to the aid and are threatening his job. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us with the latest on this. Ali, good morning. So where do things stand with House Republicans when it comes to these foreign aid packages that we have been talking about for months now? What are the remaining hurdles to try and get them passed? Well, look, among Republicans, the situation remains messy, but it was that anyway. Now what we expect to see after a very late night at the Rules Committee, we watched in a very rare moment all Democrats join Republicans to pass this rule out of committee in large part because three Republicans who sit on that essential committee said they weren't going to vote for it. This is really rare. Usually the majority party, in this case Republicans, will move along the rules so that it can get to the House floor whatever the bill in question is. In this case, we knew that three hardline conservatives had issues with the way that Johnson was approaching this, and they were vocal about the fact that they were not going to support him or help him in getting it to the House floor. There's another hurdle that we're looking for, though, and it's likely to happen at some point either today or on Saturday, which is the vote on the rule for the full House floor, because the flow of legislation goes House Rules Committee, 
to the floor for a rule vote and then on to the substance of the actual bill, what we're probably going to see is, again, rare because rules on the House floor are typically, again, handled by the majority party. Republicans still have issues with this. Democrats are likely to make that vote bipartisan. And then, of course, once you get on to the substance of the bill, we expect that the aid provisions are likely to pass in bipartisan fashion. That doesn't change the fact that Mike Johnson's job is still in trouble, or at least on the line, but it does mean that once we see the rule hit the House floor, this is on a little bit more of a glide path, even though it's happening on a weekend, which is, again, not the norm. So, And here's another thing that might be an interesting development. Legislation that could ban TikTok, which we've been talking about so much here in the U.S., could be yeah. bundled together with foreign aid. We know President Biden says he would sign a ban into law if it gets to his desk, but how yeah. does this all play out here? This is one of those fascinating things where when we talk about this foreign aid bill package, what we're actually talking about are four separate bills. The first three deal with Israel, Ukraine, and the Indo-Pacific. Those are what we expected. But this fourth bill is sort of a potpourri of different items that Republicans have put together to counter foreign adversaries in various places. Yes, some of them are focused on Iran, but in this instance, their focus is on TikTok, and it's meant to counter the Chinese and the Chinese Communist Party. But the way that they're doing it, actually might provide a softer landing on the Senate side, because remember, once the House puts its hand puts its handprint on this, the Senate has to vote on it before it can go to President Biden's desk. Because of the way that they adopted the language in this TikTok provision, it basically gives TikTok more time to find a new owner that's not a Chinese-owned company. That's something that the head of the Commerce Committee on the Senate side badly wanted. She has received these changes well. I've heard positive things from Democrats and Republicans alike who want to see the TikTok piece of this passed. They cite national security concerns as they have the entire time that this debate has been going on. But I think the important thing for viewers here who are wondering, oh my God, am I not going to have TikTok? A, we got to wait to see what this thing does and if it passes. But B, what we're really talking about here is a change in ownership. This is not really a cat that you can put back in a bag when so many people are on this platform already. But they're talking about the national security concerns of who runs it and basically how it works behind the scenes. So surrounding all this, we have have to talk about Speaker Johnson and the criticism yeah. he's facing from fellow Republicans who want to remove him from the speakership over his support for these foreign aid bills. The Freedom Caucus has actually organized a team to apparently monitor the House floor to ensure rules changes are not implemented that would make it difficult to remove Johnson. Just how real is the threat to Johnson hanging on to the Speaker's gavel? Well, you touch on two different things, right? You've got a House Freedom Caucus who are very skittish right now, especially because three of their members are the three members on the House Rules Committee that bucked their party, bucked their leadership, and said, absolutely not, I'm not going to help you get this thing to the floor. Again, that is not what you're supposed to do if you are on the Rules Committee, but this is what you get when you put hardline conservatives who have a pretty regular attitude of contempt towards leadership into those critical seats. The concern from the Freedom Caucus is, is that someone is going to try a procedural sleight of hand, maybe when they're not paying attention, to try to pull one, two, or even three of those members off of that all-important committee. That's what they're trying to fight against. Now, on the Johnson front, there's a larger battle here, and it involves the entire conference. You have Marjorie Taylor Greene still at the center of this, saying that she has a, a, a motion to vacate threat looming over all of this. In order to make that threat real and more urgent, she would have to make it privileged, meaning they have to take it up within 72 or so hours of session days. She's not there yet, but there is still a lot of tension within the conference about if she's going to threaten Johnson's job and when. See what happens. All right, Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Those April showers that bring May flowers, they are taking their job very seriously this season with a new round of rainy weather heading to parts of the country. Angie Lastman's here with the forecast. Hey, Angie, good morning. They are getting their job done, Joe, and on a Friday, too. Uh, good morning to you. We've got the rain to talk about this morning. No surprise there. The good news about today, it's going to be different than basically the rest of, or the previous parts of this week where we were dealing with big areas of the country with the potential for some severe weather. We have a couple of maybe strong storms in their forecast for today, but nothing like what we've been seeing so that is an improvement but of course we're still dealing with that rain here across parts of uh, the midwest stretching down into the south places like atlanta knoxville lexington you woke up to some wet weather detroit you're finally starting to see some improvements with that rain working to the east but now it's going to start to move into parts of the northeast the mid-atlantic and even the southeast is going to get in on this action with some stronger storms possible as the day goes on we've got that rain that'll be draped across this region here through the rest of your your second half of the day now by tomorrow 
if you're looking ahead to your Saturday plans, especially across parts of the south, this kind of stationary front is going to hang out. We're going to see some moisture. We'll tap into it, and that means we have the potential to see some heavy rain falling across this region over the next couple of days. It's not just a tomorrow problem. Uh, it's a into the weekend for parts of the southern tier of the country with periods of some high rainfall and on top of that maybe some gusty winds because of that we're going to watch for the potential for some flooding today though we're, we'll watch for some of those stronger storms not looking at a high risk of tornadoes by any means but maybe some gusty winds from places like Blacks blacksburg down to macon and out towards birmingham including parts of the carolinas as well we'll see all of those hazards uh but mainly at a low on the low end of that risk rainfall though that's what i think you should be really paying attention to here as the days go on especially through the weekend we could see one to two inches of rain across parts of the South, specifically Texas, uh, into Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Little Rock. You'll have a good chance to see some a couple of inches of rain. And on top of that, some localized spots could pick up four inches. So we'll be watching for the flash flood risk centered right around that area that we're expecting the most rain. Otherwise, some cooler air will start to taper into parts of the east. We'll see temperatures uh, lower than normal. We're already going to see that today across parts of the Midwest, but that'll shift a little farther to the south and east. It'll be accompanied by a lot of sunshine, so that's the positive of that. Meanwhile, out west, if you're looking for the warm temperatures, you sure will get it. Sunny and hot for your Saturday. We'll keep it that way for Sunday. Rain sticks around for the south on Sunday and otherwise plenty of sunshine in our forecast, Joe. We'll take it. I'm good with it. All right. Good. As Thank long you, as you're happy, I'm happy. That's all that matters, right? Thanks, Angie. Appreciate <laughs> it. Much more to come here on Morning News Now later this hour. He is an accomplished stage director, to put it mildly, whose Broadway career has spanned decades. Now Michael Greif may have just outdone himself. We're going to talk to him about his three new Broadway musicals in our latest Curtain Call. But first, so after the break, controversy on the campus of Columbia University. More than 100 protesters arrested following the school president's testimony on Capitol Hill. We'll be right back. Welcome back. More than 100 protesters were arrested for trespassing at Columbia University on Thursday while taking part in an ongoing pro-Palestinian demonstration. The protesters set up an encampment on the South Lawn of the university starting Wednesday when the school's president testified before Congress on Columbia's response to anti-Semitism. Among those arrested was the 21-year-old daughter of Representative Ilhan Omar, a Democrat from Minnesota. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton is at Columbia University in New York with the latest. Antonia, good morning. So describe the scene leading up to the arrest and where things stand right now. Good morning, Joe. Well, this all started on Wednesday. Students started to construct an encampment. They pitched tents, they brought food, and were spending essentially hours upon hours together with additional students coming to join them throughout the day. This extended into the day on Thursday, and that is when the announcement came from the university president that she was going to call in the NYPD and allow them to enter campus, something that is highly unusual at schools like Columbia that often use their own private security forces and limit the NYPD's access to their lawns. The NYPD entered, arrested uh, more than 100 students, uh, who many of whom were released last night as well, and who will be facing summons in the coming days. And this has led to immense tension here. The protests are ongoing inside the gates and on the campus. Students were there well into the night. And they say that it has strengthened their resolve here, Joe, to continue protesting the war and asking the university to not punish the students who've been involved. There was a bit of a split screen moment, Antonia, while Representative Ilhan Omar was questioning Columbia President Minou Shafiq on Capitol Hill, talking about college anti-Semitism. Then the Congresswoman's daughter was organizing this demonstration in New York. Do we know anything more about her arrest? Well, her daughter, Isra Hersey, was arrested. She was one of those about 108 students arrested by the NYPD, many of them transported on buses downtown and then released last night. She released a statement on Twitter saying that she was one of three students who received news from the administration that she would be suspended. And that is part of what has inflamed uh, the, the tensions here on campus now. For the students who watch their classmates get transported on buses, uh, be sent away with zip ties on their arms. They say that this has only encouraged them to continue these protests, that they think that for some students who previously weren't involved, it'll, it'll encourage them to get involved now going forward. And so there really is this continued 
question here on campus of where do things go from here? If students continue to camp out on the lawn, will the NYPD return? There is a small presence here this morning, but all of that remains to be seen now, Joe. Yeah, and I guess that's the question that maybe we don't know the answer. Will these arrests deter people or just motivate more demonstrations? But also just what are we hearing from the city, from the mayor about this? Well, the mayor and the NYPD have made very clear that they entered and they did all of this with the support, with the call in from the university president here. So they came in on her request. They arrested these students for what they're describing as an unlawful or unauthorized protest. And so these are the tensions that not just Columbia, but frankly, schools like Columbia all over the country right now are facing. What do you do when these demonstrations take place? And in some cases, spill over onto public streets like they did last night. Students were inside the gates, but then supporters, friends, other people from all over New York City spilled over to the streets here, and there were fights that broke out. Take a listen to the mayor describing his take on all of this. I know the conflict in the Middle East has left many of us grieving and angry. This is a painful moment for our city, for our country, and for the globe. New Yorkers have every right to express their sorrow, but that heartbreak does not give you the right to harass others, to spread hate. And I urge everyone who is protesting to please, please do so peacefully and respectfully. What we saw here, because I was here with the team at NBC News watching all this unfold in the afternoon and into the evening, Joe, and what we saw were students who were primarily very peaceful, but people who came to the campus saying that they were showing solidarity for the students, starting some of those conflicts there, uh, and they were on all sides. There were pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli people here, and they were getting into conflicts with each other. Meanwhile, the students were behind the gates having their own confrontations or discussions with administrators who were asking them to clear the lawn. And so all of this has gotten quite complicated, at times messy, and really the only constant or certainty, Joe, is that university presidents and leaders, they are facing incredibly difficult questions right now about what to do. How do you maintain free speech and allow students to let their voices be heard and to engage in debate, but also make sure that people are safe? And there really is no easy answer right now, Joe. All right. Antonia Hilton at Columbia University, thank you so much. Time now for some international headlines, starting with an arrest in connection with an alleged plot to kill Ukraine's president. NBC's Matt Bodner joins us with that in Other World News. Matt, good morning. Joe, good morning. We start things off today in Poland, where authorities have arrested a local man charged with planning an assassination attempt on Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Prosecutors say the man, identified as Pavel K, was tasked by Russian intelligence with gathering information about the airport the Ukrainian president uses on his trips abroad. This airport in question is also a key supply hub for Western aid to Ukraine. The arrest was made based on a tip from Ukrainian intelligence. It's unclear whether any information was passed to the Russians. Moving along now to Nigeria, where the military says it has rescued Lydia Simon, a woman who was abducted by, by extremists in the village of Chibok 10 years ago. The Nigerian military says a group of its soldiers found her in a region of the country that has been the epicenter of a radical Islamist insurgency for the past 15 years. Simon was a school child when abducted. She was found to be five months pregnant when rescued this week. Three of her children were also rescued with her. We wrap things up in India, where researchers have uncovered the fossilized remains of an ancient giant snake. Based on the remains, this snake may have measured anywhere from 36 to 50 feet in length. Comparing this to the largest known snakes on the fossil record, those which lived in what is today Colombia, those measured at about 45 feet. The largest living snake today, for reference, is Asia's reticulated python, coming in at 33 feet. This new discovery in India is believed to have lived 47 million years ago and could have weighed up to 2,200 pounds. Joe? My goodness, I love the graphic that shows how it would compare to an American bluebird school bus. That's, that's quite the detail right there. All right, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. That's a big snake. Thank you so much. Coming up, allergy season is here. And for millions of people this spring will be something to sneeze at. Literally, we're going to explain what's making this season especially rough. Grab the tissues and come right back. This is Morning News now. 
Welcome back. We are now deeper into the spring season. And for allergy sufferers out there, it could mean your symptoms are only getting worse. Longer and more intense pollen seasons are becoming the norm in the U.S. One reason for the increase in intensity is climate change. NBC News Chief Environmental Affairs Correspondent Ann Thompson takes a closer look. This is where David Gitler loves to be outdoors playing sports. But his worsening allergies make fun, even school, difficult for the eight-year-old. His eyes are like really bloodshot. He's just so uncomfortable that we've kept him home. Hi, David. Trend Hi. allergist Alyssa Hirsch sees in her Long Island, New York clinic. He told me that your eyes are itchy and watery. Yeah. We have more patients coming in now with severe allergy symptoms. They're coming in sneezing, congested. At University of Michigan, Allison Steiner is putting up a pollen counter to track the trend driven by climate change. Climate change is making pollen increase. It's both increasing the magnitude of pollen as well as the length and duration of the pollen season. This is an example of a birch pollen grain. Steiner says the pollen season is already 20 days longer and concentrations are up 21 percent. And the severe thunderstorms in a changing climate break up the pollen into smaller pieces that go deep into the body. While the large pollen grains are stopped by your upper respiratory system, the tinier particles can get into your lungs and they can trigger more respiratory distress. This is common ragweed. On the pollen grains, Columbia's Louis Ziska sees more proteins, another trouble sign for allergy sufferers. If there's more of that foreign substance, then you're going to show a stronger response. Proteins making the pollen more potent, multiplied by the carbon dioxide fueling climate change. The carbon dioxide is changing the chemistry of the pollen? Yes, exactly. To keep the pollen outside, doctors recommend taking off your shoes before going in, washing your hands and face, and wiping down your phone glasses and sunglasses. David Gitler uses a tray of medicines to cope as his mom worries his allergies will get worse. It scares me because I see how much she suffers from it every year. With no eyes. relief in sight. Good job. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. Let's talk more about this with NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Good to have you with us. So uh, we just heard Ann explain why we're seeing super pollen. I know I'm feeling it this year. Lots of people yeah. are feeling it. What can we do to treat our symptoms? Is there a time when you should see a specialist? Yeah, Joe, I think that if you're finding that the limits of over-the-counter therapies or some of the tips that Anne recommended and the doctors recommended are coming to the limits, go see a specialist. Go see even a primary care physician. We're seeing lots of allergies and have lots of things that we can do. And there's emerging research for children and adults for different types of treatments, depending on what triggers your allergies. Real quick, should you wear a mask outside if you're especially sensitive? Yeah. You, you can. A mask outside and believe it or not, inside. Because remember, some of these dust and kind of danders also cause problems indoors, especially at nighttime. And some, yeah, I was about to say, some of them peak during cool nights, like grass, ragweed, right. tree pollen. So what should right. we do about nighttime allergies so we can get a good night's sleep? Not Nighttime allergies, you heard a little bit of it, but make sure that you change bedding. I also recommend for people who have either longer hair or you know that this is something that's getting caught in your hair, you can actually even see the pollen in your hair sometimes. Get a good night to poo at the end of the night so that you can sleep because that nighttime, and then think about adding in your over-the-counter medication at nighttime as well, under consultation of a healthcare professional, you might need that medicine at night to help you get over those night symptoms. Clearly this impacts our bodies, but can also impact our mental health. Why is that? What can we do to keep yeah. our spirits up when we're sneezing like crazy? Yeah, so believe it or not, allergy symptoms can exacerbate known mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, but it can also just cause, if you want to wake up and do something simple like concentrate or meditate, having those allergies, those sniffles, rubbing your eyes, you, you can't even get your day started. So trying to make sure that you're in a room with an air filter, and this is one of the where, places where I might say wearing an indoor mask if allergy season is just so thick, closing windows, even though I love outdoor fresh air, closing windows and making sure that you have fresh air that you can just concentrate and have mental peace, especially at night, can help you get a good night's rest and make sure you don't exacerbate any of those mental health problems. Some great advice. Dr. Kavita Patel, as always, thank you so much. Okay. Coming up, we're calling this a Broadway-style hat trick. Three new musicals all being directed by the same person. That person is Michael Greif, and he's here to talk with us about that incredible accomplishment in our latest curtain call that is coming up after the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. It is time for a curtain call, your front row seat to Broadway and beyond. It's already quite the accomplishment to direct just one Broadway show in your lifetime, but <laughs> let's just say our next guest is kind of a theater overachiever, directing not one, not two, but three shows during this season alone. He kicked things off with Days of Wine and Roses. He's co-directing the Nicholas Sparks stage adaptation of The Notebook, and he's topping it off his Broadway trifecta with Alicia Keys' Hell's Kitchen, which officially opens tomorrow. I'm seeing this night. Very excited. Yet in the middle of it all, he still found some time to join us on set early this morning. Michael Greif, good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing three shows in such a small period of time? Well, really fortunately, all three of these shows, they're reinvestigations of shows that I got to do already. Yeah. Um, Days of Wine and Roses moved from The Atlantic. Uh, Hell's Kitchen moved from the public, and the Nopic moved from the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. So it's a, it's an opportunity to reinvestigate the shows, and very fortunately, we had mostly the same companies for all the shows. So everyone gets to dig in a second time and take all the experience of doing it the first time with us. And I think it's made it possible for me and everybody. They are three drastically different shows with different feels. Is that important to you to be able to do different things with every production you do? Well, what I hope I do is I respond to the material. I hope that I get all my cues from the composer and the book writer. And so these are really different universes. So I tried really hard to create three different universes for them. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had on Ryan and Joy from The Notebook, yeah. which is, of course, the movie is what so many people remember and the tears that it brings. And I had that same feeling when I saw the Broadway show as well. What was it Dear. you were trying to accomplish with something that's a story that's so well known to people and then you're bringing it to the stage in musical form? Well, again, I get to respond to the incredible work that Ingrid Michaelson and Becca Bronzetta bring. So by the time I reach the notebook, it's already, I'm already looking at their incredible interpretation of it. So I got to really celebrate the things that make our adaptation unique. I love how Ingrid and Becca have centered on the older couple. I love how, how thoroughly they investigate those lives. So I, I, again, I'm, I really have the huge honor and privilege of just responding to what's on the page and bringing it to an audience. Hell's Kitchen is inspired by Alicia Keys' childhood. It uses her music. She's not in the production, but her, her, <laughs> her power, her talent is all over. What has it been like working with Alicia? Oh, it's this? thrilling. You feel Alicia all through this production. You really do. Her generosity, her courage. Um, it's been wonderful. She's a great collaborator. And what I've learned, mostly I learned the reason I got this job was because she was seeing a lot of musicals in the 90s and I was doing some musical in the 90s that mattered to her. And it's been wonderful to, to actually complete a tradition. She's really happy to be on Broadway. And it reminds her of when her mind was awakening to those stories that she was seeing in the 90s. For people who see this show, what do you hope they take away from it? Well, I love this story. It's a story about a really courageous single mom. And it's a story about um, affordable housing and how New York can be a great, great environment for people of all kinds of economic brackets. There's something in this city that can enrich and enliven all these lives. You mentioned Alicia Keys was inspired by work you did in the 90s. I'm going to guess, does that include Rent? That would include Rent. What, what does it mean that say. that still inspires so many people? Because it changed Broadway in so many positive ways. You know, it really took me a while to fully understand the scope of that reach and what Jonathan Larson's legacy has brought. But over the years, I get people like... Uh, Lynn manuel Miranda telling me what it meant. Mm -hmm. I get uh, Justin Paul and Benj Pasek, who wrote Dear Evan Hansen, telling me what it meant to them. And now to hear Alicia speak of, you know, seeing that as a really young person and having her mind opened up is really something extraordinary. I can tell you, not that I have any talent, but it's the musical that changed everything for me when it came to Broadway as well. It meant so much. Michael Greif, it is a pleasure and Great honor to, to meet you. you. Congratulations Thank on you. this amazing Hollywood season. By the way, Hell's Kitchen, it's on Broadway at the legendary Schubert Theater, and it opens tomorrow. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now.
Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off. Right now on Morning News Now, Israel firing back at Iran. But what sort of damage are we seeing this morning? The retaliatory strike coming days after Iran unleashed hundreds of drones and missiles at Israel, appearing to yield minimal destruction. We've got team coverage of the uncertain fallout as violence in the battered region continues to rage. Also this morning, we have a jury. It was a process that was supposed to take weeks, now wrapping up in just days. Jury selection in former President Trump's highly publicized hush money trial involving adult film star Stormy Daniels coming to a close with a dozen tap jurors. More on their unique backgrounds and what it all means for Mr. Trump's bid for the White House. On the lighter side, we're going to take you inside one urban California community providing healing through nature in one of America's largest cities. And though Savannah is not here, we've still got to talk about the biggest news in music this morning. Taylor Swift has finally released her long-awaited Tortured Poets Department album and more. How critics and fans are reacting to a Taylor-sized surprise, plus all the other entertainment releases you simply can't miss this weekend. We begin this hour in the Middle East, which is on edge this morning following that overnight Israeli attack on Iran. A source has told NBC News that Israel carried out a limited strike inside Iran. Explosions were reported in the skies of two Iranian cities, including Isfahan, which is home to a nuclear facility. This video, verified by NBC News, appears to show a strike over that city. But Iran is downplaying the incident, saying that its air defenses shot down three drones and that the area was safe. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. Israel carried out a limited military strike against Iran. And both sides, it seems, are now trying to pull back from the brink of a direct conflict, with Israel not imposing any new restrictions, not telling the public to take any precautions, go to shelters. And in Iran, even an anchor on state media described it as no big deal. An Israeli official tells NBC News Israel did carry out a strike overnight. Flashes in the sky could be seen from Iran's air defenses over the city of Isfahan. U.S. officials say they were informed ahead of time. The target, Iranian media report, was a military base near a nuclear site, which officials say was not hit. But Iran so far isn't saying much about it. Instead, Iranian media, nearly all controlled by the state, are telling the public to stay calm, shrugging it off, showing the main circle in Isfahan with traffic flowing as normal. Some media dismissed the incident as a few small drones, claiming they were shot down. In Israel, people are out this morning, no sense of panic, calm. Earlier this month, Israel attacked Iran's embassy compound in Syria, killing at least 12 people. Iran accused Israel of crossing a red line. The White House said it was only informed at the last minute. Iran responded with a massive barrage last weekend of more than 300 drones and missiles, including massive ballistic missiles. The massive air assault was stopped by Israeli air defenses with significant help from the U.S. military and other allies. President Biden urged Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to leave it there and, quote, take the win after stopping Iran's assault. Netanyahu refused, saying Israel needed to respond. Israeli officials telling NBC News Israel needed to reestablish deterrence, but would calibrate its response not to trigger a wider regional war. Iran threatened that any Israeli incursion would trigger an immediate counterattack. So far, that hasn't happened. Iranian state media are even presenting this strike as a win for Iran. They say that Iran's strike against Israel over the weekend with hundreds of drones and missiles was so powerful that it frightened Israel into taking a more aggressive action. So both sides are now apparently trying to take this as a win, which is a very positive sign that we could, at least for now, be heading toward de-escalation and not a direct conflict. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Let's talk more about this with NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, from a military perspective, what can you tell us about how Israel appeared to carry out this attack inside Iran? I mean, given how limited it was, what do you think the purpose was here? 
Well, I think there's a big domestic component inside Israel. Uh, Netanyahu had to respond. Don't forget, he is uh, backed by some far-right politicians and segments of society. They vowed to re retaliate for the attacks last weekend. So he, he had to do something. But uh, under a great deal of pressure from Israel's allies, including the United States, Israel did not want to trigger uh, a massive kind of response that would inevitably come if it had a big strike on on Iran. And this is the result. It's uh, it's also interesting to note that uh, that Iran has downplayed it as well. It isn't over yet. It never is over. And we still may see some attacks, not necessarily uh, on Israel, not necessarily from Iran itself, but from Iran's allies, particularly Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, which is a continuing problem for Israel, Joe. Yeah, so I mean, as Richard reported, Iran is downplaying the attack despite previously saying it would respond to any Israeli airstrike. So going, building off what you just said, does that show Iran is perhaps reluctant to be drawn in further or could we still see some sort of retaliation, do you think? Well, Iran does not want to be involved in a war with with anybody, but particularly with Israel. Israel has a formidable military capability, particularly its air force, can strike Iran uh, by intruding into its airspace undetected with F-35s and other platforms, but also has the ability to strike Iran from outside Iran uh, with, uh, with weapons that have much longer range. No, Iran does not want to get embroiled in a conflict with Israel that, it, that, is, that is large and very, very destructive, particularly for Iran. And that's why, if there's any kind of conflict that evolves from this uh, series of attacks, it's most likely to revert back to conflicts with Iranian proxies, Houthis, uh, Hamas and uh, and particularly Hezbollah, Joe. Some Western officials have said that Israel was only maybe testing the waters with this attack on Iran, that it's just the first step in a broader retaliation. Do you think that could be the case here? And if so, how concerning would that be for the Biden administration? Well, it's it's possible, but Israel's got a lot of problems uh, that it has to solve. Uh, domestically and in and around its more local area. We mentioned Hezbollah, but don't forget that the large majority of forces that were in Gaza have now been withdrawn. There are a couple of reasons for that, not the least significant of which is that Israel economically can't afford to have two or 300,000 reservists on active duty continuously. It's terrible for its economy. Uh, does not necessarily want to go, probably absolutely doesn't want to go back into Gaza and administer the whole place, would be seeking with American assistance, uh, coordination with Arab countries in the region so that that area can uh, get taken care of. The biggest problem for Netanyahu, of course, is his domestic difficulties. As soon as the conflict ends, the large majority of uh, polls show a large majority of Israelis want to get rid of them. So they have domestic difficulties as well as the problems with, with, their, uh, with, with Israel's uh, uh, enemies, with Hezbollah and, and, and Iran. So lots of difficulties inside Israel, and they don't include it gendering a large-scale conflict with Iran. All right. Colonel Jacobs, as always, thank you so much. We're joined now by NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. Peter, good to have you with Thanks, us Joe. this morning. So Secretary of State Blinken is in Italy for the G7 summit. Earlier this morning, he yeah. addressed the tensions between Israel and Iran. Let's listen to a portion of that, then we'll talk on the other side. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating, uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. Um, you saw as well, or you'll see soon in the G7 statement, a commitment to hold Iran to account, uh, to account for its destabilizing activities, uh, holding it to account by uh, degrading its missile and drone capabilities.
We should point out Secretary Blinken did not directly address the reported strike in Iran. What should we make of his comments? Well, in the questions that followed, he was asked specifically about this, and the most that he would say is that the U.S. was not involved in the strikes that took place here. That's a big priority for the U.S. to communicate to Iran that, hey, we're not a part of any escalation taking place here. We did hear there's a foreign minister's meeting. That's where the Secretary of State is right now. It's in Italy. We heard from the Italian foreign minister that the U.S. communicated to those gathered that they received a sort of last-minute heads up from Israel that this strike, uh, the drone action, we should say, would be taking place. Again, and they were not told exactly when and where it would happen, but there was some notification, which means this was not a surprise. So the key takeaways here, I think, obviously relate to what you heard from the Secretary of State, Joe, which is specifically on the topic of de-escalation. That is the priority for this administration going forward, but it does obviously raise a real challenge for the administration. You'll remember, as Richard had reported in his piece, after that last strike that took place, or 300 crews and drones and ballistic missiles uh, targeting Israel, the U.S., President Biden said to Netanyahu last week and said, take the win. Let's sort of simmer this thing down right now. The only thing I'll add is we just moments ago got from the G7 its statement where they did condemn Iran, condemn Iran for its destabilizing actions, said that those strikes, those attacks last week were in theirs were in their words, quote, dangerous and focused on an effort, a priority of these Western allies to try to further degrade the missile and drone capabilities of Iran. So knowing the U.S. said, hey, take the win, warned against retaliation, is there anything else we're hearing from the Biden administration beyond what Secretary Blinken had to Good say? Good question. Here? Blinken, the first uh, U.S. official to speak publicly on this matter, only giving limited um, comments, as you noted on this. The president has no public remarks scheduled on this today. We'll see whether we hear from him. Obviously, there's been a lot of back and forth between the United States and its Israeli counterparts on this issue right now. A couple things to keep a close eye on, I think, over the course of the day is a continued focus on this idea of de-escalation. The U.S. has made clear that its support for Israel is ironclad as it relates to Israel's defense, but that it would not, and this was communicated, communicated to Israel, participate in any offensive operations taking place. So I think that's what we're going to see over the course of the next 24 hours. Where do things stand right now in the relationship between especially President Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with this needing to support Israel, especially when it comes to Iran, but also the concerns yeah. with what's happening in Gaza. Now, you ask a good question, right? And this uh, last day or two now raises real questions about what influence the White House and this president has over his Israeli counterpart, over the uh, the leader, the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. He told him, basically, he urged restraint, said, in effect, don't do anything more. You need not do anything further. Israel obviously did. I think the U.S. will be largely satisfied, if they are to be, that this was limited in scope. It could have been much larger. I think their initial understanding is it was likely to hit Iranian proxies outside of Iran, targeting Iran itself as an escalation in and of its own right. But it does raise questions about that relationship, which has grown increasingly tense. They've known each other for decades. But obviously, given the situation in Gaza right now that the president's been increasingly critical of, these two do have a, a delicate relationship they're trying to maintain in some form. All right, Peter, good to see you in person. I'll see you tomorrow morning on Saturday today. Thanks for joining us. Turning now to the historic trial of former President Donald Trump, jury selection moving much more quickly than expected with a 12-person panel already set. The former president is accused of falsifying business records to hide hush money payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest. Hey there, the process that some had predicted to last for weeks, now nearly done in just three days. A cross-section of Manhattan residents with different backgrounds and different opinions on Donald Trump, often highlighting how much Mr. Trump has been a fixture in New York City long before he was ever president, making finding a jury to judge him here all the more tricky. And then there were 12. A full slate of jurors now sworn in to hear Donald Trump's first criminal trial. The former president in a chilly Manhattan courtroom as four men and three women were added to the final jury, including an investment banker, security engineer, retired private wealth manager, as well as a speech therapist, physical therapist, someone who works in e-commerce, and a product development manager. The jury vetting process moving in fits and starts this week, with 96 prospective jurors showing up Thursday, only to have nearly 50 excuse themselves out. There's no way after my online presence, um, where I've satirized this man again and again, 
they would regard me as, as to be fit to serve. Many prospective jurors admitting they're unable to be impartial when it comes to the former president. In the case where prosecutors accuse him of falsifying business records to cover up his alleged role in silencing adult film star Stormy Daniels on the eve of the 2016 election. He denies any involvement with her and has pleaded not guilty to all charges. I'm sitting here for days now, from morning till night, in that freezing room. Very bad thing. The whole world is watching this. The difficulty of both seating a jury and keeping them insulated from outside influences in such a high-profile case illustrated when the judge had to dismiss two jurors Thursday morning who were impaneled less than two days earlier. One expressing concern she could not be fair after loved ones figured out she'd been picked for the jury and confronted her. The rare opportunity to come face-to-face -face with the former president also prompting a mix of reactions from a former Bernie Sanders supporter apologizing to Mr. Trump for calling him names online to a self-described wannabe hockey player thanking Mr. Trump for fixing the ice skating rink in Central Park. Court will pick up today with the selection of five additional alternate jurors. And if all stays on schedule, we could see opening statements from the prosecution in this case beginning as soon as Monday. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. For more, we're joined by NBC News legal analyst Kristen Gibbons Fedden. So, Kristen, we finally have a full jury faster than expected. We did also see those two jurors excused, one because she had concerns about her identity being revealed. So, explain to us why isn't this jury being sequestered or isolated in any way from the outside world? You know, that's a great question, but you know, sequestration really involves substantial costs and it can really be truly a, a hardship and burdensome on those jurors. Um, so what I guess the judge has done in this case is he's implemented alternative measures to really protect impartiality and privacy. He's instructed them to avoid media exposure and really has restricted the media from disclosing identifying information about the jurors, like where they live and where they're employed. So these are the efforts that really aim to do the same same thing sequestration does, but at a minimal cost. But with the recent dismissal, as you and Laura pointed out, you know, those privacy issues are truly underscoring the ongoing challenges that may be presented in this case. So if this continues to arise and threaten the trial's fairness, certainly Judge Mershon is going to have to revisit his decision and the need for sequestration. I'll talk more about that in a second. I want to ask you real quickly about this search for alternates. We still need a few more of those. Do we expect that process to go as quickly as the rest has gone this week? I do. You know, I think they're going to face the very same challenges that we've seen in the last few days. But as you kind of pointed out, and as Laura pointed out as well moments ago, you know, the judge is really moving at a fast pace and faster than we anticipated. So I think they have 100 more candidates coming in today. It's going to fill those five slots. And I do believe, based on the way that they've been moving, that there could be opening arguments, uh, opening statements beginning on Monday. All right, let's talk about this gag order. Trump quoted a Fox News host on True Social and said, they're catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. The DA says that Trump has violated the gag order multiple times. We know we're going to hear more about that next week. So I got a two-part question. First, do you think that post violates the gag order? And second, given that one juror has been dismissed over these privacy concerns, what do you think the judge can do to make sure that the gag order is enforced? Yeah, I definitely do think that this violates the gag order. You know, the gag order explicitly prohibits Trump from making or directing others to make public statements about any juror or prospective juror. So even though the, the Post was quoting someone else, right, that anchor, Trump still chose to share that quote. And if I was a prosecution, I, I would argue that by posting it, he actually made it himself by posting it on a public forum. And I would ask the judge to see that this was an assertion that could undermine the jury selection process and potentially intimidate jurors. Now, referring to your second point with regard to in enforcing the gag order, I think you know, ultimately, the trial judge's main responsibility is to ensure juror protection and a fair trial. So the first step would be scheduling a hearing in which the judge has already done. But the second step is that he must adopt a strict approach to ensure in, in compliance. So he, if he does find that Trump um, did violate that order, he could impose a fine, restrict courtroom privileges, or even impose jail time. All right. We will see what happens. Kristen Gibbons-Fedden, as always, thank you so much.
Now, the House of Representatives is nearing a potential vote this weekend on foreign aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. House Speaker Mike Johnson is pushing to get this aid passed despite threats from fellow Republicans to remove him from the speakership. Meet the press moderator Kristen Welker has the latest. Good day to you. Overnight, foreign aid bills for Israel and Ukraine took a major step forward. They're now headed for a vote on Saturday in the House. They're likely to pass in an incredibly rare move. Four Democrats joined five of their Republican colleagues to vote these aid packages out of committee. Now, what does that mean? This committee, it's called the Rules Committee. It always, always votes along party lines. But the fact that Democratic votes were needed just underscores the extent to which some far-right Republicans still oppose more aid to Ukraine. Now, look, these developments overnight in Iran are undoubtedly going to add more urgency to get Israel aid passed. All of it, though, is a major test for Speaker Mike Johnson. He's been on the job for about six months. But right now, two House Republicans are so enraged over sending more aid to Ukraine, they're threatening to oust him. Meanwhile, the question is, is his job really in jeopardy? Technically, Johnson's job is with those lawmakers dangling the possibility of trying to remove him. But look, I had multiple conversations with Republicans overnight, both in the House and the Senate. They say they feel confident Speaker Johnson will ultimately keep his job, even if it means he's saved by Democratic votes. And remember, former President Trump tried to throw him that lifeline with that joint appearance at Mar-a-Lago last week. These sources expressing real frustration, though, to me, that more chaos in the House could potentially hurt Republicans on the campaign trail. We'll have to see how it all shakes out. Back to you. All right, Kristen, thank you. Cool and warm temperatures are battling it out across the southeast and Midwest as we head into the weekend. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. We've got some chilly temperatures to start, but some folks, yes, are going to be in the 90s. We'll get to those spots, but we've got to start where that cool air is. Nine million people right now under these frost and freeze alerts at places like Minneapolis, Sioux City, Omaha, stretching to La Crosse. That is where we're going to see the chillier conditions and kind of out from that region, we'll see lower than normal temperatures. Uh, but temperatures right now into the 30s in places like Minneapolis. We've got Waterloo sitting at 35, Des Moines at 34. So cool conditions for sure and sitting below normal even into this afternoon. These temperatures in places, uh, Kansas City, upper 50s. We've got we're just 43 degrees in Minneapolis. We're running more than 10 degrees below normal for this time of year in a lot of these spots. But what a difference a, a quick jaunt to the south gives you. We've got 90s on tap across much of Florida, 80s for parts of the Carolinas. And by the way, this region is going to pick up likely on some record highs later today. We'll see how that all shakes out. But even tomorrow, well into the 90s, a smaller section of the country of this region, but still into the 90s for Jacksonville, Fort Myers will hit 88 degrees. That cooler air does start to filter a little farther to the south and east here as we get into your day tomorrow. So Saturday in Buffalo, not getting out of the 40s. We've got low 50s on tap for Chicago. Little Rock will be into the upper 50s and Omaha sits into those mid 50s uh, for tomorrow. The milder kind of spring like conditions do return. We'll see a, a bit of a rebound here after we get through the weekend. So if you live in Milwaukee, you'll have the 50s for Sunday, but by Monday back to the 60s. We'll go from the upper 50s in Columbus on Sunday to the upper 60s on Tuesday. Charlotte will end up into those mid-70s by the time we get into early next week. We do have to dodge some raindrops this morning and even through the weekend. Notice this system is going to bring some showers across parts of the northeast, stretching down to the southeast today. And then we have plenty of rain on tap for Saturday and Sunday across parts of the south. This will be something that will give us the potential for some flash flooding across specifically places like Texas to Mississippi and up through Arkansas and Oklahoma. Uh, we'll see that rain finally exit, but again, not before the weekend. And by the time all is said and done, we'll pick up maybe one to three inches in some of those spots. So watch for the flooding concerns. All right. Sounds good, Angie. Thank you so much. Got it. Much more to come on this Friday edition of Morning News Now. Yes, of course. That includes Taylor Swift's double album release overnight that took fans by surprise. Plus, are the so-called streaming wars coming to an end? Why Netflix is saying it's going to stop reporting its quarterly subscriber count. We're going to take you to Wall Street a little later in the hour. This is Morning News Now. Back now with some international headlines, starting in India, where almost one billion people have started voting in the world's largest election. NBC's Matt Bodner has that in other world news. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Let's kick this one off in New Delhi, where, as you mentioned, polls opened this morning. 
uh, for the largest election in human history. Friday marked the first and largest round in these Indian elections in which 969 million people are eligible to cast their votes. The election will take place in seven phases over the next six weeks and its results will be consequential. India's current Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking re-election for a third term. His powerful right-wing party is aiming to take an outright majority in government and therefore a mandate to continue pursuing controversial Hindu nationalist policies. Moving along now to West Africa, where a massive and lethal heat wave earlier this month pushed healthcare infrastructure in the region to the brink. Scientists are now saying that the extremely high temperatures of 110 degrees Fahrenheit would not have been possible without human-caused climate change. Estimates of the human cost of the heat wave are in the hundreds to thousands of victims. And we wrap things up today in Guatemala, where archaeologists have recently discovered the scorched bones of at least four adults in an ancient Mayan temple. The archaeologists believe that these individuals were of royal lineage. The scorched remains have left some scratching their heads, however, wondering what the significance of burning the remains would have been. Most likely, according to scholars, this was a deliberate and potentially public desecration of their remains, possibly the result of some kind of leadership feud during a time of great social upheaval. Joe? All right, Matt Bodner, thank you so much. Tomorrow marks 25 years since the shooting at Columbine High School. It was April 20th, 1999, when Littleton, Colorado was changed forever following the mass shooting that killed 12 students and a teacher. To remember that tragic date, the community is going to be hosting a day of service and recommitment to helping others. NBC News senior national correspondent, News, News Daily anchor Kate Snow traveled to Columbine to take a look at what's changed there. Hey, Kate. Yeah, good morning, Joe. I think what really strikes you when you walk into Columbine High School now is how vibrant it is, packed with students doing all the things that teenagers do. The senior prom is tonight. What happened that day in 1999 was horrific. Obviously, it will never be forgotten. But 25 years later, they are a tight community with a culture of kindness, connection, and pride. People think of Columbine as what occurred 25 years ago. We don't see it as that. We see it as this is our home. This is the place that we feel safe in. As teenagers crowd into Columbine High School, their energy feels inspiring. A generation of students building their future on a campus with a tragic past. Current principal Scott Christie and former principal Frank DeAngelis are showing us the Columbine of today. So this is the cafeteria. We used to have the library upstairs. And you've changed that completely. Now, a vaulted ceiling filled with panels of aspen trees in memory of the 13 who died that day. Twelve were students. Dave Sanders was a coach and a teacher and the father of Connie. We really felt initially for a few years he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that changed to he was in the right place at the right time. Why? Once we started realizing the impact that he had. Sanders saved many students that day. Over the years, I've run into people that were his students, and I had one, one couple ask me to hold their child, and they said, this baby wouldn't be here without your dad. Mm. He had saved them in the cafeteria. Lives that wouldn't be here. Lives that wouldn't be here, and, you know, for all of time, there will be people that exist because of what he did that day. Ashley Gladder was just 11 when her brother John Tomlin was killed. He was just a very kind, caring, sweet brother, just one of those boys that has a sensitive side and is very thoughtful. Both women say their losses gave them a greater sense of compassion. It completely changes your world, your perspective on everything. But it also gave me a really big heart for kids who had been through loss. Connie is now a mental health specialist working with people who've committed violent crimes. Can we link that directly back to what happened to your dad? It is linked directly to what happened to my dad. I see it as carrying on his legacy. It's really important to me that we stop the violence where it's starting. So we decided to come back in. Former Principal DeAngelis helped lead Columbine through its darkest times. Now he works with a network of principals who've endured tragedy, counseling school leaders when shootings happen. What do you do at the first graduation? How do you work with the media? What do you do about re-entering the building? What do you do about memorial? And you but even more than those practical matters, DeAngelis says Columbine now serves as proof that a community that's been through so much can ultimately become a source of joy and pride. 
And when I do reach out to these other communities, I'm stating, I know where you are now, we were there, but 25 years later, we're stronger now than what we were. And I really believe that. Everyone I met described Columbine as a community where people care about each other. They expect hundreds of people to show up for that day of service tomorrow on Saturday. Mr. DeAngelis says last year they had more than 1,000 people. Connie and Ashley told me they love that 25 years later, a tragic day is now marked, Joe, with something positive and encouraging for the community. That is so good to see. I was there 20 years after the tragedy, and you know they know how Columbine is this heavy word, and they've done so much to try and just make it as positive a thing yeah, as possible. Yeah, exactly. All right, Kate, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, the Caitlin Clark effect rolls on this morning from a hero's welcome in Indiana where she's slated to make her WNBA debut for the Fever next month to that side-splitting performance on SNL Ribbing. Weekend updates Michael Che. We've got more on her historic week as America embraces a new superstar. Stay with us. That's next. Welcome back. She's the athlete we've all been talking about this week and beyond. And excitement continues to grow surrounding basketball superstar Caitlin Clark. After that historic and record-breaking run in Iowa, Clark is now drawing crowds to Indiana, where she's set to start her next chapter in the WNBA really soon. Our national senior national correspondent, Stephanie Gosk, is here with more on that. Steph, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. It's been a big week for the star players. She started off here in New York as the number one pick at this year's draft, then headed to Indi Indianapolis, where she made her debut appearance with the Fever. Now, with her first pro game just weeks away, Clark is once again proving her worth as she closes in on a major new endorsement deal. <laughs> After a year for the record books, Caitlin Clark is just days into her new chapter in the pros with the Indiana Fever, and her star power is undeniable. A 22-year-old receiving a hero's welcome in Indianapolis. I can't think of a better place for myself to start my career. And making a splash on major sports airwaves. I think I'll be like moving here in like a week. Country superstar Tim McGraw rocking Clark's New Jersey at a sold-out concert in Indianapolis overnight. And her massive fan base only getting bigger after this awkward moment Wednesday with a local reporter who made her signature heart gesture. Here. I do that at my family after every game, so. Okay, well, let's cool. start doing it to me and we'll be able to get along just fine. Immediately jumping to her defense online while the reporter later apologized for his behavior. Clark's legions of fans are also rallying around the player amid a growing debate about her new salary, saying she deserves much more than her rookie payout. It all comes as America's favorite new superstar is continuing to break barriers. A record 2.45 million viewers tuned into this year's WNBA draft, featuring Clark as the number one pick. The new number 22 jersey has already become the top-selling jersey ever for a draft pick. Average ticket prices for Fever games have nearly tripled since last season. There are other teams that are moving their venues. Yeah so that people can come yeah. and watch you play. Yeah, I think it's it's cool for women's basketball. Playing on the professional level is a whole different deal, but um, a crowd is not anything I've ever shied away from. <laughs> <laughs> now with crowds watching her every move, Clark is set to ink a major new endorsement deal. According to The Athletic, she's nearing an eight-figure contract with Nike that includes her own signature shoe. The lucrative deal all just a part of the growing Clark effect. I want to be like her when I'm older as the young phenom continues to usher in a new era for women's basketball. More people we can bring into the league will only help the league to grow. The Washington Mystics are the latest team to announce a change in venue for their matchup with the Fever due to unprecedented demand. The team says their game on June 7th will now move from their home arena, which has a capacity of 4,200, to a venue nearly four times the size, oh Joe, that goodness. holds... 20,000. Pretty soon it's just going to be football arenas everywhere. They'll be playing yes. these games. I love it. All right. We can only hope. Thank you yes. so much for all your coverage this week. Appreciate it, You're Stephanie. Welcome. Living in big cities can sometimes make connecting to the great outdoors a little difficult. But one man who missed nature started a company to try and bridge that gap. NBC News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz has his story. For Michael Washington, the outdoors have always been a way of life. A lifestyle he thought he'd have to abandon when he left Colorado for Los Angeles to pursue a career in music. I didn't understand that you can't have a connection to the outdoors while living in a major city. For 10 years, music was the focus of his life. I loved studying music. 
I loved the idea of how music and artists brought people together that didn't know each other and they could all relate to a song. But something was missing. So when the pandemic hit, the show was stopped, took inventory of his life. I was able to take a step back and really understand that you know, what really is going to fulfill me moving forward in my life is like helping people find this attachment and, and relationship with nature. So he started USA, a community built on connection to the outdoors and wellness. Each month, Michael partners with various practitioners across a spectrum of fields in nature and wellness to create community. Give us a tail. Yes. I mean, this is incredible. And provide wholesome, healing, connected experiences. This is extreme sport. <laughs> so we, at this point, do around 20 to 30 events each month. Be it a guided run, an experience with falconry, or vegan Cuban cooking. Hi, everyone. Today I'm making tacos de palmito. Each adventure, in essence, a love letter to Los Angeles. This is a really great way to bring people together and get people connected with nature. We do these types of trips to really help create that connective glue. I caught up with him, the heart of LA, for a breath and body workshop and a cold plunge. But we started with our feet. This is called toga. Toga is literally yoga for your feet. Learning how to ground and center ourselves through our toes. Our feet are basically what connects us to the ground. Then it was a breath workshop in preparation for an ice bath. The sympathetic nervous system is going to create a gasp reflect. You're going to gasp for air and you're going to take a few big breaths. And then it was time to start slowing everything down. We're going to breathe to the beat of the music. Wow. After getting our breath together, it was go time, but other people first. So, I guess how many pointers you see that have to build it perfect. Yeah, like that's your initial thought, you just have to really suppress it. Like, once you get that, you know, feeling, you just have to put it down. Put it and, down. And you leave it down. And yep. leave it down leave in it down. the ice. Finally, reluctantly, it was my turn. Let me go see if those people cross the street. <laughs> OK, let's get this done. And on a chilly 52 degree LA morning, I got in 51 degree water. Step in, no. oh. All the way down, shoulder under. Kiss it all the way down. Oh, Elsa, you, you ice queen. OK. <laughs> My Arctic dip only lasted two minutes. It was in bigger. I don't even need coffee. It seems like your background, you bring marketing. Yeah. You bring a little bit of that music community, that sense of people vibing together yeah. for yeah. a shared purpose. And I just kind of changed it from, from music to outdoors. You know, still building community around people that I find extremely inspiring. Yeah, like your whole body tingles. You're like, I mean, I feel you just great. Gotta have an I feel warm. Yusa, a flowering nature and wellness collective in the heart of LA. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News. Ooh, all right, coming up, it is a pop sensation that is sweeping the nation. And no, we're not just talking about Taylor Swift's new album. After the break, we are diving headfirst into what's being called 2024's Pop Girl Spring, a season positively stacked with new releases from some of the biggest names in music. That is next. Back now with financial headlines, starting with the popular messaging apps that were removed from China's app store. CNBC's Silvana Hanau has that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning and happy Friday to you. Yes, yeah, so Apple removed WhatsApp and threads from its app store in China, saying it was ordered by the government to do so. The tech giant said China's top internet regulator made the request due to national security concerns. Now, this is China's latest example of increasing censorship. An Apple spokesperson wrote in a statement that the company is required to follow the laws in the countries they operate in, even when they disagree. Netflix announced that it will stop reporting subscriber numbers each quarter, a sign that the streaming wars may be coming to an end. The company's co-chief executive said the changes come from wanting to focus on the key metrics that they think matter most to business. Netflix posted quarterly earnings Thursday, which showed that the service's ad-supported streaming plans helped bring in 9.3 million new subscribers, crushing analyst expectations and highlighting the success of their password-sharing crackdown. 
And San Francisco sued Oakland over the city's proposed new airport name. Officials in Oakland voted in favor of changing the name of the airport to San Francisco Bay Oakland International Airport. San Francisco argues that the change will cause confusion and is already financially affecting the airport. The city is asking the court to prevent Oakland Airport from moving forward with its name-changing process, claiming that it violates San Francisco International Airport's trademark, Joe. Yeah, that might be confusing. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think right. so. Yeah. Solana, thanks so much. You got it. This spring is stacked with major pop releases from some of the biggest female artists. Already this season, we've heard from big names like Ariana Grande, Grande and Beyonce have delivered new, highly anticipated albums. And of course, overnight, you might have heard Taylor Swift dropped her 11th studio project, The Tortured Poets Department. And there's still much more new music to come. NBC News correspondent Chloe Malas has more on what we can expect. This morning, a new era for Taylor Swift. The superstar releasing her highly anticipated album, The Tortured Poets Department, overnight on the heels of a record-breaking tour. Welcome to the Eras Tour! And more Grammy wins. All I want to do is keep being able to do this. I love it so much. And Taylor's just one of the female artists with new music and what's taking shape as pop girl spring across the music industry. With Cowboy Carter, Beyonce just made history as the first black woman to top the country charts for the hit album. This is her best album. Cowboy Carter is better than Renaissance. But that's not all. From March through June, almost a dozen of music's biggest female pop artists are releasing albums. I found a and fans are here for it. What a time to be alive. Ariana Grande's seventh album, Eternal Sunshine, debuted at number one in March. Days later, Casey Musgrave scored her biggest sales week ever with the release of Deeper Well, says Luminate. Dua Lipa's radical optimism drops on May 3rd. Billie Eilish two weeks later with Hit Me Hard and Soft. And Megan Trainer's not far behind with Timeless. We are hearing that we are living in something called Pop Girl Spring. Yes. What does that mean? Feels like the spring has been so chock full of great new pop music. Nora Princiati, who coined this season's catchphrase on her pop music obsessed podcast, Every Single Album, says all of this new music is bringing people together. I think maybe there's a little bit less fear of stepping on each other's toes and maybe a little bit more excitement about just being part of a, a big moment and people having fun with it. A big moment that continues to be a big boost to the economy. Swiss Eras Tour brought in over $1 billion, helping her earn a place on Forbes' billionaires list, the first musician to do so solely for their music. Beyonce's Renaissance Tour giving an estimated $4.5 billion boost to the economy. And now her new album, Cowboy Carter, becoming the biggest country debut in Apple Music history. Even boosting the sale of cowboy boots by 20%, according to CNBC. I think there's probably some added excitement towards the idea that everybody could listen to something at once. It's like the positive version of peer pressure. Fans enjoying the sounds of spring, hoping they become the anthems of summer. Our thanks to Chloe for that report. The fun doesn't stop there. Katy Perry took to Instagram recently to tease her upcoming sixth studio album. And many female artists are set to hit the road this year, including Megan Trainer, Maggie Rogers, Tori Kelly. Olivia Rodrigo will continue her Guts tour overseas later this month. And of course, Taylor Swift is set to bring the Eras tour back to the U.S. this fall. We've got more on Taylor Swift and her new album, The Tortured Poets Department, coming up in your weekly Can't Miss list. And who better to give us a rundown of the latest and greatest in the world of entertainment than our good friend and pop culture whiz Brian Balthazar. He joins us next. Stay with us. We're back with a Super Bowl-sized problem for now-retired NFL star Jason Kelsey. The former Eagles center says his beloved Super Bowl ring was lost, and get this, a pool of chili. Kelsey shared the story with his brother Travis on their New Heights podcast, saying it happened during a live fan event, which involved a game where fans dug through the chili looking for Super Bowl ring replicas, but he also tossed in the real ring. After sifting through beans, tomato chunks, and meat, they never found the real ring. 
Kelsey laughed off the loss and said, we can safely assume that my Super Bowl ring is now in a landfill someplace in the Cincinnati tri-state area. So many things we can say about that. <laughs> Finally this hour, it's Friday, which means it's time for your can't-miss list, all of the music, movies, and shows you need to see and hear this weekend. Joining us now, entertainment journalist, pop culture expert, and chili aficionado. <laughs> I'm truly Brian trying Balthazar. to soak that, that in. Is, like, that's a lot how big was this that. Adam Chili, right. I want to know. I and mean, then how and quickly, and like, do you put some gloves on, or you right, just go all just, in? There's yeah. a whole batch of chili that no one's eating. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> that's a lot to ask about. All right. But it's a Taylor Swift kind of morning. Let's talk about Taylor Swift. You've listened right. to and memorized all 31 songs. Who hasn't? You. you. You don't look that tired. You look very well rested. I had it on right. in the background, but I was also like <laughs> right. listening to breaking news this morning, right, so it was right. kind of a, a strange combination. Right. But well, when you I'm check enjoying your, it so yeah, far. When you check out your coworkers this morning, if they look yeah. tired, you may know why. Uh, but not only did she release her album at midnight, she then started a countdown to 2 a.m. and launched another album. Right. So it's a double album for a total of, I think, 31 songs. Yes, 31. Uh, totaling two plus hours. So, and it is, it is deep and it is raw. She looks very tortured there. She's so. tortured. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. Well, the lyrics are very deep and raw and emotional, which we have come to expect from her. But this one seems really significant. I mean, she had a lot going on in her mind for the past, what, how many years it's been yeah. since this seven-year breakup or seven-year relationship that led right. to a breakup. You know, and obviously now everyone's reading the tea leaves. This is about Joe. This is about someone else. Right. But it's some people wondering if there's the one that's about Travis now right, and all right. that. Yeah. So and it's interesting to see the context of this woman who we see right now seemingly in the most upbeat time of her life exactly now reflecting on wow but she's had all this going on at the same time like processing all that it's information a reminder, we all right. have ups and downs we all do that's an important message for you right now which camera can we point that out to you? um now uh it's by the way it's already the was the most pre-saved page on spotify no we'll see a music there. video the yeah. post malone lone song fortnite i think is the one that's premiering today that's maybe the one. tonight okay. yeah so is I mean, that the one that's post malone so, yes okay yeah very good so we can expect to hear a lot more of taylor swift i feel like this is not over not so distant right. future let's go to the theaters abigail it's about a young ballerina who is kidnapped yes. but then turns yes. the table on her abduction. it's a horror movie so things are not going to go well right, right. okay so these Young criminals, ne'er do wells, hooligans, ruffians, if you will, um, <laughs> kidnap the ballerina, the young ballerina, of daughter of a very powerful and wealthy man. And you know how when you see a preview or you see a movie and you hear that one shilling your line that you're like, oh, oh, yeah. oh, that's the line. And she says very innocently, I'm sorry about what's going to happen to you. And then Ooh. there's where she says it right there. Oh. And then things start to happen. I don't know if she's a vampire or a beast. I'm not giving it away. It's a horror movie. You know things are going to go badly. And um, yeah, she's I not love just the a banner. ballerina. Kidnappers regret abducting. Abigail. That is that is the perfect line <laughs> and the perfect understatement. It's, that's a hard job, by the way. Whoever has to do those you, has to sum it up in like yes. 18 letters. It's not easy, and that is perfect because you, I think this is really fun, and I love a, a scary movie that doesn't happen during Halloween. All right, let's get that's, <laughs> that's just my. I'm intrigued awesome. by that. I yeah, want to know what I, she is I, I now. See all right, it, yeah. We Grow Now, a coming of age drama set in the 90s. What should we know about this? Right. Okay. So this is if you're looking more for like an independent film, film festival darling. This is about two young kids coming of age in the Cabrini Green housing project in Chicago mm -hmm. in 1992. And it's a story of kind of friendship and the innocence of youth that gives you strength through really difficult times. It's getting a 96% on oh, wow. Rotten Tomatoes. So um, this is a really an emotional journey from Sony Pictures Classics. So it's in a lot of the oh, independent film theaters. Oh, that's going to be really theaters. great. Yeah. All right. Under the Bridge, a new crime drama series on Hulu. Hulu correct. And it's exploring actual murder cases from different perspectives. It's a, it's a, it's a story. This one is about a, a young girl in British Columbia who, at 14 years old, was attacked by her peers, bullies, and died. And this is the script version of this story and it uncovers what exactly happened there's lily gladstone fresh off of her oscar nomination and um and it's a harrowing story and they're trying to get to the bottom of how this could have happened why this happened and then the trial that ensues so it is based on the story of uh rena verk and uh riley keogh and lily gladstone are among the stars of this and it's going to be gripping the story itself is just gripping the real story yeah and lily gladstone so yeah. great all right we got 45 seconds here dinner with the parents on amazon prime it's based on a british sitcom called friday night dinner yes and i gotta say we have, we do not have a good track record of doing series that the brits have done so so the reviews the have not been great. Well. Yes, okay. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that, but I can talk about some others. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Michaela Watkins, Dan Bacadol, and Carol Kane, some great performers. Yeah. Uh, but not look it up. Give it a try. <laughs> I can't promise anything. We say can't miss. You might miss 
If you, of all the it's things. It's the last on the list. <laughs> of all if, the if, things on the your, list. If, your if time there's is something limited, you might I mean, want to miss. Yeah, you might. We don't have time for everything. It might be nice out. All right. <laughs> Brian Balthazar, <laughs> as always, you. good to Woo! see you. That is going to do it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.